We'll just wait a, a short time now for a few people to come, but um, I'm very excited that you're all here to hear the stories that we're going to share today. It's lovely to see you all. First, uh, I will uh, mention that we are recording the uh, webinar as we always do. And uh, so I just wanted to let you know that. <clears throat> And uh, welcome to our monthly webinar um, to support caregivers. That is the purpose of our webinar. And today we'll hear the stories of several caregivers whose loved one has passed. And we welcome your responses, questions, and sharing after all three uh, will sh have shared their stories. Um, so uh, that's always a pretty special time to hear people's reactions and questions. So save that for then. And, and just to say, um, we believe, I believe in storytelling for healing and for learning. So thank you all for coming. All three of these folks um, have participated in Daybreak's Caring for the Caregiver Support Group, which is something that is available to you. If that's something you need, you may know more about it when we're finished and we can talk about it. But these three folks all know each other very well from that setting. And um, I just wanted to bring you in on, I have titled each of their stories based on what I felt in hearing and knowing these folks. And I have their permission to introduce them with these titles, if you will, okay? <laughs> and the first uh, story we'll be uh, sharing will be by Cleo Dixon, who is here with us. And I call her story self-healing. And then Sarah Nieder will, um, will share with us, and I call her story Double Whammy. Mm. And last but not least, Pamela Doolin, and I call her story True Love. So uh, with that said, um, thank you all again for being here, and Cleo, if you would start. Thank you so much. My name is Cleo. I'm caregiver. I was caregiver for my mother, Alberta. At first, I was doing the caregiving two or three days a week. And then I realized my mother needed me more. And on the other days, I was working at my church, feeding the homeless people and giving out bags of food to people in need. Then I began to see my mother needed me five days a week. And I started taking care of my mom to help my sister be able to work in peace. So I was there during the day and my sister was there during the night. I would say my whole life changed because I was working five days a week and no pay. I gave up my life as it was. I felt it was the right thing to do. Anyway, 10 years of caregiving. Please remember, for caregivers, please remember to take care of yourself. After uh, so many days a week and six years, I went for my yearly physical and I did not have any symptoms at all. And the nurse asked me to, how, how did I feel? And I said, I feel fine. And uh, she said, well, sit here a few minutes because I'd like to take your blood pressure again. So uh, I sat down and then when I went in, was called in to see my doctor, my doctor said, how are you? I said, I'm fine. And the doctor said, well, um, I need you to sit on the table over there so I could take your blood pressure. So um, in my mind, I'm starting to think what's wrong, you know? So anyway, when the doctor took my blood pressure, I said, well, what is it? And she said, it's 196 over 110. So I said, that's high. And my doctor gave me several blood pressure medications 
but uh, I could not take them. It was four that she tried me on. Either I had a reaction to them or something else happened that I couldn't take it. So anyway, I told my family that uh, my blood pressure was up and I gave them a two week notice that I could not take care of my mom any longer. And uh, I told them to find someone. Well, the next day, my sister sent me a text who lives with my mom. She said, I changed the locks on the doors. You can throw your keys away. Mm -hmm. So I cried like a baby. I called a close friend and I talked and cried to her and I cried at least a month off and on uh, feeling that time that my mom was 93. I did not see my mom that after but my mom would call me some days and ask me, why, why wasn't I over there? And when was I coming? And I just said, mom, uh, uh, things have changed and I don't have a key any longer to get in. And I said, so that's why I'm not there. And it was out of my mom's six children. It was only two of us that cared for her. And uh, we took on the responsibility for responsibility for caring for my mom. She passed on 8-23-2015. After passing, I called my sister and I said to her, I know mom passed because what happened, I woke up in the night at 3.31 the day my mom passed and I knew she had passed. And so I called my mom, um, went to my sister and I told, you know, she was the youngest sister too. And I told her mom had passed and I was wondering if she needed anything or was she okay and all that stuff. And then I asked her if she needed me to help her, you know, with getting rid of mom's stuff or whatever there was to do. And then I went back about two weeks later to visit my sister and see if she needed my help. And everything was gone. Everything that belonged to my mom was gone. And I said, yes, I cried about that too. It hurt, but what do I know if I'm not? It hurt, but what I do know is not everyone thinks like I do. Maybe she felt she did the right thing. As far as I know, none of my sisters or me ever got anything from our mother, just the sister who lived with her. After death, one day I was crying my eyes out and then I started laughing. And I said to myself, Cleo, why are you crying? I said, she was 97 years old. You did your best until you couldn't do it anymore. Just think of all your friends who lost their mothers and fathers when they were in their 20s and 30s and some even in their 40s. I said, mom had a good life. Nobody called to check on me, but my daughter, Darlene. I raised, I'm okay. It's what it is, I'm really okay. I got back into exercise at the senior center in San Leandro on Tuesdays and Thursday classes. I enjoy cooking in the senior housing where I live. So if I have uh, much, uh, too much food, I share it with other neighbors and people out there because I don't believe in wasting food because I know many people are hungry and don't have money to buy food. I've connected with friends for, uh, from grammar school, junior high school as well, and kept in touch. In 2019, my ex-husband died. In 2020, uh, an adopted daughter I had died. And in 2023, one of my old my oldest sister passed. So I'm grieving all this grief all at one time. Uh, uh, I had started um, when I was at the senior center. I saw a sign up there about daybreak and caregivers. And even though my mom had passed, I went over and I uh, 
filled out paperwork so that I could uh, be with the, be in the class for daybreak and caregivers. And uh, one time, one day during the time, I think I left the tape. I'm sorry. No, no, anyway. Anyway, one day while I was in, at daybreak and uh, with the group that I had joined, which was very helpful to me and helping me get through, even I didn't have them when my mom was living, but it was so much residual that I had to work on after she had passed that it was very good for me and it helped me. And then oh, one day uh, I had a meltdown even at daybreak and I had talked to Kara and, and the other people there and let them know that I did call my uh, provider and get to see um, a psychiatrist. And it was a lot of post-traumatic stress that I had been um, dealing with, but I didn't know it. And uh, so I worked on that and got through with that. But I want you to know that no matter who you're caring for, take care of yourself. I'm doing walking in my building, three floors every day. I was doing exercise with Spectrum on YouTube Tuesdays and Thursdays, but then that got canceled, but I still do exercise and stuff and walk. And um, I'm told, um, I've also been told by Dave Frey, and which we all know, being a caretaker is the hardest job you'll ever have. And I just want to say that also this year, I took swimming lessons because I didn't know how to swim. I'm 82 years old, and now I do know how to swim, but I don't. I can't be in the Olympics yet, so I'm still taking classes. And I just wanted Daybreak to know that I missed them when I had taken that time off. And I want to thank Daybreak, Olfa, Karen, Saucer, and Susan for their valuable and needed help. And I want to thank all the other caregivers that I have met through Daybreak and how they have helped me. And that's the end of my story. <laughs> thank you. Oh, my God. That is so wonderful. What a wonderful share. Thank you, Cleo. I'm so proud of you learning to swim. Oh, my goodness. I mean, swimming is so wonderful because the water just holds you once you learn to trust it. So it's just a perfect metaphor. Um, so um, we will have more questions and sharing uh, for Cleo, but let's go on to our next share, which is Sarah Nieder, and um, she'll share with us. And as I mentioned, the title of her story my title for her story is Double Whammy. Take it away, Sarah. Okay, well, hi, I'm Sarah, and I am uh, I'm uh, have been with Daybreak for quite a few years in, in this support group. Uh, I started out, I was taking care of my mom, and I was still working, but I was, you know, getting pretty close to retirement. But anyway, I was taking care of my mom, and she, um, she got she had a traumatic brain injury and which from something that happened in her brain she some she had like a it was like a a thunderbolt it was electrical she had like a stroke only instead of it being a blood a blood problem it was an electricity problem and um you know like a stroke there's nothing they can do about that so they just you know watched her and sent her home and but she never really recovered. And then eventually she did develop dementia. And um, while I, I was taking care of her, she needed more and more care. I eventually did retire in 2019 in the spring. And then when I, when I was finished, when I retired, I kind of looked at my husband. I said, oh yeah, you, let's see, how, how are you doing? <laughs> Well, I really started thinking about that strongly when the electricity was turned off and I realized that he was not paying the bills. 
So that was the beginning of me starting to take care of him. And um, so I took care of him for five years. My mom uh, died in 2023 and he died just three months ago in May. So um, I'm kind of, you know, I, I, I'm kind of in the, in the throes of the beginnings of, of grieving in a way about him. But, but what I wanted to say about grief is that, you know, from the time that you really come to grips with the fact that your loved one that you're taking care of is not the same person that you that they that you have been with for however long if it's your mom or your or your spouse or a sibling and and i think the grieving process starts then that you are you know for me it was it was losing my mom then also with my husband you know it was losing our the, the life that we were going to have together when he when i retired and he was had already retired, so that, you know, I had to let go of that. And so I, I, I was a, a, just a, you know, a period of continuous grieving. That's, I think that's what I, I would say um, to, to all of you that are on that, on that journey, as they say, is that, is that it, it, it doesn't begin when the person dies. It begins when you go, oh my God. <laughs> Something is seriously wrong here. That's to me. That's when it's that to me. That's when it starts, and that's when I start thinking about the person. If I'm if, if it's a person in my group, if their their person hasn't died yet, but but we all consider them to be grieving, and I and I agree with that. So, um, then when he died and my mom died, well, when my mom died, I was already in the thick of taking care of my my husband. So I really didn't have a chance to grieve with her at all. And um, then when my, my husband died, which was just now, I, I was mostly thinking about him. But now I've realized, you know, just in the last few weeks that really, I, I have to give myself the space and the compassion to be thinking about my mom as well. And really, you know, say goodbye to her. So uh, that's hard. I was very close to my mom and then um, close to my husband too, of course. But, but you know, my mom, I was, I was really close to. She lived with us very, she lived close with us in the next door. So that's about, that's pretty much what I would say. Let's see, I'm looking, Karen, I mean, uh, Susan gave me some, questions to help me think about what I'm saying. So I realized that one of the things that I I didn't mention was that I was so fortunate, so, oh, so fortunate to have when I was taking care of my mom, both of my sisters were very supportive and helped, helped me, even though I was the primary caregiver, helped me every step of the way. And um, with my husband, I have two daughters and, uh, and my sisters live close in the Bay Area and my daughters also live close in the Bay Area. And my daughters also dedicated themselves to, um, to my support and to taking care of me while I took care of their dad. So, um, I mean, they took care of him too, but you know, mostly they were, they were aimed at me, not him. And so that was a, a huge gift that I got from all four of those, my, precious family. So I, I was very, um, very well supported in that, in that way. And I, I'm just so, so fortunate in that. So let's see, I think that's, that's pretty much all I have to say. Um, <laughs> I would ask you to tell us a little more about how you are now. Oh, how I am now. Well, it's really interesting. So the first about six weeks, I was just thinking about this today, about, so it's been three and a half months. So the first six weeks or so, I just laid on the sofa and watched, binged Netflix and read books. 
and read and read the New York Times. I I can tell you everything the New York Times ever said in Jan in uh, July and and in June. But then um, I think that was just a physical reaction from the work and the and just the stress and the and the heart the heart work that you do is the physical aspect of the heart work. And then after um, after that, I you know carried on and. Um, just in the last two or three weeks, I have felt uh, a, a lightning of my a lightning, and I feel like I'm coming back to myself. So, so that's really really wonderful. That I feel much more. I have my ener most of my energy back, and um, uh, you know mo most of my energy back, and uh, most of my you know, my, my get up and go, which has always been my, my, uh, my, an important part of for me. Oh, and then the other thing, oh gosh, this is, this is another huge thing is that my, my daughter had a baby on, she was pregnant this whole time. My husband was dying and, um, she had a baby on June 11th. So I've been, uh, they just have thrown that baby at me and, <laughs> said here mom this is this is this is your gift you know from the cosmos you know to console you while uh, after dad died so i've had this incredible baby experience you know almost the whole time that that he's been dead so that's that's also been wonderful she's um she's two and a half months now and she's just a, a, such a blessing so so that's been fabulous and um and then I want the other thing I want to say, I'm sorry, this is all jumbled, but another thing that I, I think, and this is something that I struggled with the whole time and we talked about this in group over and over and over again, which is what one of the things about caregiving is how fucking repetitive, sorry, my language, how repetitive it is. It's just like this day after day drudge and trying to keep your, your spirits up and I don't know, I don't mean to make it sound so negative, but you know, it is, there is a certain re repetitive part to it. And, uh, and the grief is repetitive. And I think that the, the letting go and, uh, you know, the process of letting go and letting go and letting go. And I thought I was pretty much done. I thought by the time he, he had finally died, you know, I was over it. But now I think that what, what I finally, uh, the, the grief that I'm having now is that, oh, <sighs> no, the whole time I I just, I thought, you know, even though we, talk, we talked about this so often in the group, you know, that, that you have to, you know, you have to distance yourself and, 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 you know, and let, and let them go. And, you know, the part of you is saying, yes, I'm, I'm doing that. I'm doing that. But then you think, oh, well, maybe, you know, maybe, 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 you know, a snowball chance in hell is still a snowball, is still a snowball's chance. I mean, it's something, you know, I was, I was at that place where you just think, well, I know they're not coming back, but maybe just maybe they will. And when they die, then, you know, okay, they're definitely not going to be back. So Ugh, I think that's the th the thing that I'm I'm really struggling. I'm not struggling with, but I'm just feeling that a lot. That okay, you know now now he's now he's entirely gone. His entire spirit has gone into me. There's nothing, you know. There's no more of him left, and all and all of what I have, which is not inconsiderable, is what he gave to me and what I have from him. So. Um, you know, it's it's a lot, but I'm you know, but but the companion, the the love, you know, that person's not coming back, and that's that's hard. So <laughs> that's where I am now. Oh, and then there's one. More thing. This is something I I want to say in my in my to my group to, to to a new person in my group, but I'll say it to you guys, and that's that. Um, one of the things at the at the end when I was really he was really very very ill and needed a lot of attention and you know just like just like I just jettisoned more and more of my life that was my life you know in order to take care of him 
And I really, I said, you know, I can do this. We talked a little bit about sacrifice, you know, um, you know, I can, I can make this sacrifice if I know that when it's over, I'm going to be all right. I know that it's not damaging me, you know, like I'm happy to do this. I'm willing to do this. It is what I want to do. I know one is making me do this. I feel good about being here in this place of caregiving as long as it's not crushing me permanently. And that, and that, and I really stepped back. This was in the spring. This was like March and April. And I really thought deeply about that. And I said, you know, I'm not being damaged. I am going to be okay. And then, then I felt, you know, I think that, I think that is a, is a good question for that caregivers need to ask themselves. But the answer for me was I was not going to be damaged. And then I could let go of that fear and, and care for him with my whole heart and not really be so afraid and that uh, afraid for myself. And, um, and then, and now I feel like I am coming back to myself and I, I was right. I didn't get damaged. I'm sorry. And I miss him, but I'm okay. So that's, that's what I hope for, for everyone is that, you know, that they end that at, at the end, you know, they're, they're sorry. And they're so, you know, they miss their person, but they're okay. So that's it. God. <laughs> oh my God, Sarah. Well, each, each additional thing you added was just so important. And the final sharing that you've given is just like a, a gem for us. I, I, I feel that and I, I can see that people really need to hear it, really need to hear it too, yeah. Um, and uh, now Pamela, uh, who is our last speaker, will share with us. And as I mentioned to you, I have my little titles for everyone. And her title is True Love. <laughs> Emily, go ahead. Well, I just want to say to Sarah, having a new grandchild is very therapeutic, I am yeah. sure. I don't know what I'd do without the grandchildren. Um, my husband, Roy. Roy died three years ago, uh, and I miss him every day. Um, we were married almost 58 years and did most things together. Roy was born in Manila, Philippines, and he and his parents spent three years in a Japanese prison camp, prison camp during World War II. Many starved to death before MacArthur's troops liberated the camp on February 3rd, 1945. It may have been that experience that resulted in Roy developing a deep appreciation for everything he worked for, and he believed in enjoying every day. He was articulate, intelligent, well-educated, and had a great sense of humor. He loved his work, family, and friends. He was an only child, and he took great pleasure in being the father of four. Prior to Roy's vascular dementia diagnosis, he lived an active retirement life, enjoying family and grandchildren, took long walks, met friends for lunch, walked around campus, and took courses with another friend, and traveled and read and enjoyed the theater. Some nine years before his death, he started to put reminder post-it notes on the bathroom mirror. I was always a list maker, so I didn't think much of it. And it was in 2013, while at a family camp with our adult children and their families, that our four sons had a meeting to discuss their dad's memory problems. Over the next eight years, I increasingly took over the managing of his life and included him in all activities, encouraging him to do whatever he still could do. We were helping out with our grandchildren during those years and he was, he was still able to walk. It was as though he was one of the kids and he would follow along everywhere we went, hikes in the woods, rides on BART, outings to museums. The grandchildren were very protective of Pop Pop and participated in his life to the end. He was losing pieces of himself gradually. Excuse me. And it took something dramatic to realize he could no longer do a certain activity. Probably the first realization for me that something was more serious 
When I was in one room, he was in another on the phone ordering his many medications. At some point I realized he was confused and that the process was taking so much longer than I remembered. When he got off the phone, I asked him if he would like me to help out with the ordering of his medicines and assembling them. And he was so relieved when he said yes, that a light bulb went off in my head. And I realized that this was gonna be the long, long journey of decline. Over time, more and more things would happen. And I would realize he could no longer do this or that, and we would have to do a reset. There was the last bus ride where he arrived home in an Uber, having fallen, entering the bus, gashing his head. Some unknown kind stranger bandaged him up and arranged a ride home for him, me waiting at the curb, wondering why he wasn't on the passing bus. This reset resulted in my getting him a Trackamo watch um, so that I could track him when he was out in the neighborhood, neighborhood taking walks. Several times I would rush to the car to chase after him when I could see that he wasn't taking his usual path. His last independent walking was during the pandemic when he was reduced to walking between two telephone poles while I worked in the garden. As he approached a pole, I would shout out to him, turn around, Roy. He would touch the pole, turn around and walk back to the first pole, back and forth, back and forth, using walking sticks for stability and me shouting, turn around, Roy. Managing Roy's health issues and his life became a full-time job. Relief for me came about six months before the pandemic when I signed him up for two days a week at the Alzheimer's services of the East Bay. From nine to four, he was engaged in protected activity and socializing with others while I had some time for myself and to get some things done. What a relief, at least until the pandemic struck and everything was shut down. We came, became part of a, uh, we became part of the University of California Dementia Pilot Program study. Sensors were placed throughout the house, near the exit doors, the stove, the sink, and sources of water in the bathrooms. Unexpected activities would trigger an alert on my phone. And one evening while making dinner and not planning to be at the back of the house for some time, I heard an alert. I took off and discovered the sink of the master bathroom was overflowing, water filling the floor, just reaching the threshold, going over the threshold into the bedroom. Roy had just turned on the water and taken off for some other part of the house. Participating in that study was worth it just for that one event alone. Over the years of Roy's decline, he had some hospitalizations and a month in rehab. He could walk and talk, though his speech became more challenged. Limited in what he could do, he still had opinions and he knew what he wanted. September, the year before his death in August, he needed surgery for cancer. He walked in and he walked in and he walked in talking and he came out of the first operation. He was walking and talking when he came out of the first operation. The next day, following one of two reconstructive surgeries, he could no longer walk or talk. Instead of returning home, he remained in the hospital several weeks until the final operation. Once home, he now had a hospital bed in the bedroom and spent the next several months in physical therapy, hoping to relearn how to walk and talk. This was not to happen despite all efforts. November, 2020, our children and their families arrived Thanksgiving. Roy thrived on the attention and the familiar holiday routine, eating with gusto, sitting at the table in his wheelchair. After dinner, we returned him to his bed for a rest before dessert. Within 40 minutes, he started to violently shake. The ambulance arrived and whisked him off to the ER. Within a day, I received a call from the palliative care doctor who said that Roy would never be better than he was at that moment, that he would get other infections and would we be interested in hospice care. Since it was COVID restrictions, we met with a hospice social worker in our backyard to go over the details. I then went off to play with my granddaughters while my children and their wives transformed our dining room into Roy's final room. 
One hospital bed left, another arrived along with an oxygen tank. Roy returned home to the care of his family, a hospice nurse and a hospice bather. From December to August, this room became the center of the universe. I cannot say enough about how helpful hospice was in their support to us and our family. How do we make it without outside help other than hospice, providing total care for those eight months during the pandemic? Two of our four sons live locally. A third one lives 250 miles away. They and their wives were able to work from home in our home on their computers as were the grandchildren working on their Chromebooks for school. Taking turns to help me out, celebrating all birthdays, anniversary, holidays, February 3rd liberation in this one room, we all bubbled together. When the grandchildren arrived, I would get a break and take off with them to hike and explore the outdoors. This time of family bonding, facing the long goodbye together, made us ever closer as a family. I'm grateful for my family's support and that we were able to share this precious time together. Any outside contact for me beyond my family was on Zoom, sitting next to Roy's bed so he could be included. Meditation, Susan's exercise class, caregiver support group, my mom's group, rotary meetings, family gatherings on Zoom to connect with my 103-year-old aunt isolated with COVID restric restrictions in a facility where no family was allowed to visit. That isolation would have been Roy if he had lived in a facility. Instead, he was at home, surrounded by family. When Roy was ambulatory, he and I would do exercise classes with Susan through daybreak. When he could no longer walk and was bedridden, I would do the class, Roy by my side in his hospital bed in the dining room with Susan on Zoom. She always talked to him and included him as a member of the group. Staring at the ceiling, he loved this hour with Susan. One day with the music in the background and Susan's cheerful voice, he got very animated and he clenched his fist. And as clear as day, he said, this is great as though he were exercising right along with us. Another day while on Zoom with my mother's group, Roy said, I love you very much. To which all the moms said, oh, and I cried. As the hospice bather left the house one day, he shouted, that was terrific. He <laughs> clearly enjoyed his bath. We took to putting post-it notes with quotes of every lucid sentence Roy spoke on the wall next to his bed. I'm not sure when I started the daybreak caring for the caregiver support group with Karen and Susan, but talking with and learning from others going through the same or similar experiences was such a relief. And it was an opportunity to learn, share ideas and feel supported with fellow caregivers who understood the isolation and challenges of taking care of a loved one. Roy needed total physical care. His dermatologist came to the house and decided he needed, needed mo surgery for a cancerous growth on his head. Every trip out of the house was an ordeal, whether for COVID vaccines or surgery. Two sons would carry him up and down the 19 stairs to the car on a tarp for his appointments. I think Roy so enjoyed being surrounded by family and all the activity that he lived longer than he otherwise might have. A best friend from the prison camp sent us a book he wrote sharing his mother's writings on the Santa Tomas prison camp experience. I decided to read the book to Roy not knowing whether he would understand any of it. There were many references to Roy and his parents and Roy became very excited as he recognized parts of the book sharing his own memory, memories, even though it was all unintelligible. Early summer, a son shared with Roy that he had proposed to his fiance. Roy again got very excited, jabbering away with enthusiasm. It was clear he understood and was very pleased. Late July, things changed. All of a sudden, Roy became very quiet. It was a struggle getting him to eat. He didn't babble and just stared at the ceiling and I was confused. 
I called my cousin in San Francisco, who is a geriatric doctor. She asked if she could visit and she came that day. And while I tried to feed him something for dinner, she said, stop. Any denial I had at that point vanished. She asked if she could spend the night. And of course I said, yes. We assembled the bed next to Roy for me, which we did nightly. And holding Roy's hand, I woke up during the night to find my son and cousin standing by his bed. Next, step, next day, somehow, as if by magic, the extended family from around the Bay Area assembled in our dining room. Everyone got to say their goodbyes. One of my sisters hadn't arrived and I was afraid she wasn't going to make it. I told Roy she was on her way. Everyone seemed to be holding Roy, a hand, a knee, a foot, a shoulder. And finally, my sister came through the door and put her hand on his head. I, I whispered in his ear that she was here and began to sing from a musical that he loved. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. And as I finished the stanza, he was gone. One of our sets said that long ago, his dad had told him that he didn't want to die alone. He didn't. He was surrounded by the love of family and it was a beautiful death in his home. day I got a beautiful feeling everything's going my way now three years later I can appreciate being the first to go the one left behind is left to grieve and pick up the pieces I remember back when Roy was still able to speak he said you're going to miss me when I'm gone He knew so much more than I could take in at the time. And yes, I miss him very much. For me, I think I put off thinking beyond Roy's death, so consumed with the day-to-day -day de details of his care. I do second guess myself. Did I do enough? Was I patient enough? I do have regrets at not looking through photos of our life together to see what memories it would trigger for him when he was still able to speak. I thought I would feel, feel relief when the struggle was over. Instead, I just feel the loss and the loneliness of losing him. They say not to move on or make too many decisions the first year. The first year is a blur. In many ways, the continuing pandemic probably factored into my wanting to hibernate. I continued to have Zoom activities and volunteer work and certainly didn't make any major decisions, though I thought I should get rid of things in the house. That didn't happen. Year two, I managed to arrange much neglected repairs on the house. And thinking about this webinar, I realized I've been in limbo and need to figure out the rest of my life, make a plan and stick to it. With fewer years ahead than behind, I feel a sense of urgency while I still have my health. Though I prefer being outside in the garden over the work inside, I can no longer avoid the accumulation of years and years of material possessions from living in one location. With the choice of working in the house or being out in the garden, I prefer the garden. It's very therapeutic. And I choose time with my family over all else. I'm still trying to get used to living alone and I'm taking one day at a time. Roy is always with me. And I am reminded of a quote from Thomas Campbell, which is, to live in hearts we leave behind is not to die. Roy is in my heart. Thank you. I'm so grateful to you all for sharing your stories. Um, it is so important to be able to share your story, to teach each other about how to take care of yourself 
And there is no right way or wrong way to be a caregiver. You know, you'll never get it right. You'll never, you know, you're not going to come out of it thinking, hey, I did it. I did it perfectly. And it's really a, a labor of love. And um, I hope that, uh, that those folks that are here today to share the story got something helpful um, for themselves as caregivers and can share it with others. And please consider joining Daybreak's caregiver support group if you yourself are a caregiver or have been one and you, you need support. Um, I, I think you can see how powerfully helpful that is. And um, I'd like to, to uh, give you all a chance to ask questions or share your story. Um, whatever uh, moves you to share right now, it would be, it would be a gift to, to, to hear your sharing. If you have something, I have a question. Um, do the daybreak have um, adult daycare programs where um, I can leave? Uh, it's my wife in this case. I can leave her there uh, so that um, she can enjoy some activities, socialize, uh, some structured activities, because right now, all she wants to do is to lie down, just 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 not do anything. So you have such programs? There is a wonderful program in the Alameda County area called ASEB Alzheimer Services of the East Bay. A S E B. <clears throat> There is a program in the in the Bay Area in uh, Alameda County that ha has just that. It's a program for people with uh, dementia. They provide transportation from home. They're very skilled in working with adults with uh, cognitive progressive disorders. And um, and I think as was shared here somewhat, it's a very important thing, not just for you, the caregiver, but for the care receiver to have appropriate activity to stay involved, because though folks might not be able to communicate like they did, they're still in there, if you will. I think that theme was touched on quite a bit by Pamela. Um, and I, very important that people with Alzheimer's and dementia, cognitive decline have appropriate activities beyond what you alone, you know, can do or sh can do, just period. It's just not possible. So are, are there, are there uh, in the Alameda County or in the Bay Area, Pleasanton, Livermore, Dublin, and, and near, near those places, are there places where uh, there are paid programs uh, where they, you know, from eight, six or eight hours a day, they can take care of somebody. My wife doesn't have Alzheimer's. Uh, she has FTD, frontotemporal dementia, yes. very early, early stages. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Where she, she has cognition. She eats well. And she understands where she is, but um, she is just not uh, able to participate in activities. Uh, I can't you know, do it at home. So I was thinking if there are paid program where I can pay some monthly fee and there's structured program, are there any like those? The one that I mentioned, it depends on where you live, but probably close to where you live, there's something. What area are you in? Pleasanton. Pleasanton. Well, I don't know what's out there, but I think if you just look up something from the Alzheimer Association and see if they have a program out there. Mine was on the East Bay. And yes, it was wonderful to have him be able to go for several hours a day to be with other people. And it freed me up and it just, it was 
really very much needed. It was only because of the pandemic that we had to stop, but I I loved it when he had that program. Was it a paid, paid program? I'm sorry? Was it a paid program that you paid? Yes, but yes, it was. It was, yes, you could do like from nine to four. I, did, I chose to do two days a week and it worked out really well for us. If you qualify for Medi-Cal, they will pay for uh, that program. And one other important thing I want to say to your question, um, Mr. Verk, is that um, it's not one kind of uh, dementia or cognitive impairment that they serve. So uh, if your loved one has, doesn't have exactly dementia, Alzheimer's, it could be vascular change, it could be as in Pamela's case, um, so that that would not uh, preclude that that this would be a good program and uh, we also have a an, an assist line daybreak does and we will send you all our newsletter with all of that information how to reach us about our programs so more information will be coming at you okay, okay. Uh, Thank you very much very much and barbara did you want to share about your program i do uh good afternoon everyone i first of all wanted to commend all three speakers uh just a beautiful insightful um presentation and remembrance of of the loved ones that were lost and um one takeaway for me, a large takeaway, which I already knew, uh, was love never dies. And that was the thread that read, ran through all three um, presentations. And they, they were definitely from the heart. <laughs> and there, there's no time period as to when you're going to stop grieving. You know, I've lost a husband and recently a son. So... Um, there, I gained a lot of strength from just hearing uh, your stories. So um, thanks again. Um, I also work for Daybreak uh, as a counselor and um, a certified um, pastoral care uh, person. And right now we're holding a um, caregiver support group every Tuesday at Beth Eden uh, Church in Oakland. And Cleo, I think I know you. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, the program runs from um, uh, noon to 1.30 uh, every Thursday. And people are, are, are really bonding. Uh, so far, uh, no one has lost a loved one yet, but what we do is, uh, preparation for the future. You know, we look at the inevitable and um, just find joy in, in bonding with each other. So that I want to offer um, to the group. Karen, yes, please. Yeah, share. I would like to share. I'm Karen Kelleher. I'm coordinator for our Daybreak Support Group of which Cleo and Pamela and Sarah are a part of and have been for a good many years now. And uh, it's been a joyful experience. I think they uh, would all agree that it's been very helpful in their journey. But what I wanna emphasize is that all three of these strong, wonderful women have chosen to stay on with our group to serve as mentors, to continue in their own healing process, to uh, be a support for those that are on the trajectory of a loved one with the terminal illness. Uh, they are immeasurably of value for us. And uh, it's been a wonderful and continues to be a wonderful experience. And so I want to <laughs> A shout out to all three of you because of your willingness to share who you are and what your journey has been. You give people the idea, you give the caregivers an idea that you don't lose yourself forever. You said it so beautifully, uh, Sarah. You don't 
lose who you are. And that's a big fear when you have to devote so much of yourself to a loved one who is in decline. Uh, to know that there is life after that grief is a process, not a destination. And that the grieving process begins almost from the time that the diagnosis is given. You are losing parts of your loved one. And so the continuity that these three wonderful ladies uh, are contributing shows that the continuity goes on and your value goes on and what you have gained, you can give forward to others. And so it's, it's a wonderful experience. Yes. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to share? Allison, are you speaking to? Uh, no, <laughs> okay. I wasn't sure. Anyway, um, yeah. So you're all welcome, as caregivers here, if you're here and you want to be part of one of our groups. Um, uh, we have three groups that are virtual, and they're dropping in free. And uh, and then uh, Reverend Barbara's, which is uh, in person. Yeah, Cleo. I was going to say, when Susan asked me first that I want to uh, share my story, I kind of looked at it and I said, no. <laughs> and then I thought about it because I know all the help that I've gotten from other caregivers. That made me think about what I'm saying or what I'm sharing with you make it help someone else. And that's what made me do it too as well. But I didn't even know until I started speaking too that grief it 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 comes and goes because my mom died nine years ago, but her anniversary of her death was just somewhere this week, and I I was sitting up and I was sad and then you know I kind of got out of it but I'm just saying grief is something that you just go in and out of periodically and no one can tell you oh. Get over that. I don't know why, you, you know, yeah. I don't pay no attention to people like that. So I just want you to know, I appreciate you, everyone who came and uh, hopefully, you know, sharing my story too. I appreciate it. So look for the newsletter. You'll get it in your email and you can listen again or share it with others and get more information about the programs that we have as a nonprofit here in Alameda County. We've been doing this work for a long time and we really care about you all and a lot of folks are involved in this work of caring for caregivers. So reach out. Thank you. And thank you, Susan. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank, yes. You. thank you so much, Susan. Yes. Thank you all. <laughs>